Welcome to episode 20 of Building Jam. We're talking to the founders and builders who we really respect and asking them for advice. And today we've got Colin Sidoti, who's the founder and CEO of Clerk. If you let users sign into your product, you might want to use Clerk. They provide amazing authentication. And the reason why we're so excited to chat with him is because, oh my gosh, if you just see the design of their product and website, everything is so crisp. And we talk about how to craft high quality products and what are the traditions and tactics they use on their team. Let's do this. I want to start with one thing in in particular, which is, oh my God, your design (laughs) is out of this world. It is so good. Like the landing page is stunning. I follow this guy, James McDonald on like LinkedIn and Twitter, and he shares like designs that he's doing for you. And just everything is so crisp. Where does that come from? Why are you doing that? And how are you doing that? Oh man. Uh, I mean, the, the where and how is, uh, I mean, we hired Derek, so he's pixel janitor and then Derek just uh, assembled this like crack squad team of, of just incredible designers. And it's pretty wild. The community, it's like, they're all friends with each other. Um, and we just got lucky enough to, to kind of get them all at once. Um, uh, the why I guess is, is really just like, uh, it's part of our thesis that like dev tools going forward, like people want to not just buy the utilities in the back end, but actually buy the best practice. And so, um, you know, a sign in form is well defined today. And so uh, we can design it the same way Stripe checkout, design Stripe checkout. We could optimize for conversion. Um, and I think like, we need to put that foot forward on every surface of the product. So not just the embeddable clerk sign up, sign and user profile components, but actually just everywhere in the marketing, in the docs, uh, and so on. And so, uh, yeah, super excited to be working with them. And, uh, it's, it's just been a huge level up too, for the, for the brand, for the business and so on, since they got started. So like everything comes with trade-off, right? Like, um, you can move super fast on design, but then it's less polished. What what does it actually take in practice to ship such great design? Like how how much lead time do designers have before an engineer can even get started? Like how does it work in Clerk? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it like everything else. It's a constant like evolution. I think the um, uh, what's nice now is we're starting to get to the point of like things are templatized enough. So like our change log, like we're able to produce change log assets uh, a little faster than when they first started, just because there's a a robust library to pull from. Um, For, you know, the website redesign, it was a couple of months. Um, And uh, I'd say that, you know, the main thing that we provide for the designers is, is just like context on how our customers are thinking about it, right? Like how does a, the average clerk developer think about auth and how, like basically a bit of the storytelling. Um, and, and then they just kind of run. It's, it's really wild to watch. Wait, wait, wait. but how much lead time do designers have before the project starts? (laughs) Uh, I mean, we normally start with like a, a DX guide, which is effectively, um, write down how a developer is going to end up using this. And with that, we're hopefully able to assess like, when does design need to be pulled in? When does engine need to be pulled in? And, you know, in the optimal scenario, we get that estimate right and they work in parallel and then they kind of come together at the same time. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, they work relatively fast. Like it, it's it's not common that like design needs to be holding up engineering like they're able to collaborate and uh launch at the same time and so the reason why i'm asking is because yeah um, like like you all we believe that um that building trust like starts in shipping high quality designs and that's how we communicate to our users that we care about their experience and that they can trust us in every aspect of the product, even the ones that are behind the scenes that they don't see. And so we really, really care about design. Um, And the outcome of that is we'll spend a lot of iteration time on design before an engineer even starts writing code. 
And, and sometimes we're just not ready for an engineer when they are ready. And so we'll like shift yeah. around how we're building the project just to give designers more thinking time because we think the impact of like their extra week on this will be so worthwhile in the future. Okay, I'm curious about another part of the product cycle, which is um, at the, so that's like the beginning of a project. At the yeah. end of the project, like every company has a different, like how much time should we spend on polish before this ships? So like a jam, the guideline is always like, we spend 25% of the time it took to build the thing in extra polish. So if it's like a big project, took a long time, we spend more time. If it's a small feature, like took four days, we spend an extra day on polish. How, like, what does that look like at Clerk to get these like incredible, super crisp, like? Hmm. I think, um, I feel like it starts with the demo day. So we have like an internal demo day and yeah, ideally at that point, the team feels like this is ready to launch or they're saying like, it's not ready to launch, but I'm asking for feedback and then they'll do another demo. Um, yeah, that, if there's going to be an extra like long polished stage, I think it happens after that. And I would say it's not consistent at all, right? Like I'm, I am intrigued about this. Oh, it's 25% per project. I think for us, it's like, like 0% a lot of the time. And then sometimes it's like 200%, right? Like it just, just the whole thing gets derailed and we're back to the drawing board. Like we, we missed the core assumption. Um, and I don't know. I feel like I, I put a lot of reps into thinking about like, how could we have caught that earlier? Um, and, and that's what stresses me out more than like uh, the 25% polish time. I think we, tr we really try to get a lot up front through these DX guides. Um, and it's not perfect. Like obviously as you build the projects, you, uh, you like learn as you go and things need to get tweaked. Uh, but just getting in the mindset of how is a developer going to use this and like actually trying to write the docs and where is this going to live in the docs and so on. Like, I think that that helps tease out a lot of the, you know, polish steps that will need to happen. And so we get to, to get it into the initial scope. I'm curious more about this uh, demo day. What is, what is this internal practice? I, uh, before I jump too much into it, uh, it's funny that like, I'm talking about these things like they're rigid and we're perfect. Um, that's definitely not the case, right? Like it changes all the time. And, uh, you know, we're constantly tweaking and pulling levers to, to try to get it more optimal. I think even the way I'm talking about DX guides, um, you know, the part about it needs to write docs instead of just, you know, describing the product surface changes, like that's like two weeks old there's positive indications <laughs> that it's working, but like it's new. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I do hope that no one's, you know, watching me and saying like, oh, this is the way. Cause it, like, I really think the way is, is more just iteration um, and, and heat seeking and, and just finding what works for the team. Um, and with that, I forgot what the prompt was. So you're going to have to remind me. <laughs> Ian, Ian wanted to know about oh, demo God. days, but now I, but like, I wonder, I wonder if you're willing to share, like what you just said is so interesting that the, the process is always changing and these DX guides, um, the process changes yeah. two weeks ago and now it's better. Any chance you're willing to share what it was, how it's changed? Like, yeah, I, well, um, what it was most recently is, uh, you know, basically an outline of what are the changes? So like, like what, where are we going to add a toggle in the dashboard? What is the, um, you know, new import in the SDK and how is the developer going to use this within an XJS app? Um, a lot of that is you know, you can write those pieces down. Like what are the dashboard changes? What are the SDK changes? What are the marketing site changes and so on? Um, the, what the change we've making made slash making is, is, you know, instead just put this in the, um, through the lens of a developer actually using it and describe like, okay, 
like write the guide, right? Write the guide that's going to live in the docs. Um, and that guide will say, go to the dashboard, toggle this on, and it'll say, you know, then this is what you need to do in the SDK. And I think that that narrative step, like the, the more just like pushing it through the lens of the developer, we catch a little more detail about, let me, yeah, I could just give you a specific example. Um, the, we had one for invite only. So we're building a wait list feature um, for Clerk. And so, you know, we do sign up, sign in today. Uh, but what if an app is launching and they, they're not ready for public signups? So we're doing this like invite only and waitlist feature. Uh, and we had done a DX guide in the old world where, and it was basically like, oh, we're going to add this toggle in the dashboard to, um, there's like a restrictions page of the auth flow. And it's like, uh, there's going to be a restriction that's invite only. Um, and then optionally they can turn on a waitlist and uh, there's going to be a new waitlist component. And it's like, it all made sense, right? You're, you're reading through it. And it's like, okay, like, yeah, that restrictions place like makes sense for where uh, invite only would go. But when we actually went to write the docs and guide for it, I think what we realized is like, like, hey, if someone is starting an app, or if someone's coming to Clerk and they're planning to start with a waitlist, it's really weird that like our whole dashboard onboarding is assuming that they're not doing that, right? That they're starting with a public signup. And also the like canonical getting started with clerk guide is telling them how to set up a sign up and sign it. It's not telling them how to set up a wait list. And so there's like this broader problem of, well, how do we figure out during onboarding that they're a waitlist customer and not a signup customer because it's it's weird to like our first step of onboarding is like tell us how you want users to sign in and they're just thinking hey i want like i just want a waitlist um and so to have them go through that and then also find this like deeply nested restriction setting like maybe they'll find it but it's better for us to just like zoom out a bit and figure out okay what what is the fork um uh, earlier in the product that we can create that that kind of lets the developer choose earlier on. And I, I guess had we not gone through the exercise of trying to write the guide and tried to place that guide in the, the doc sidebar, we wouldn't have noticed like, oh, it's really weird that this is like at, like like it should be after it should be before the getting started guide, but like, what does that even mean? Like getting started is the first thing. And right. It all just like spiraled out of control, but that, that was the eye opening, um, uh, important part that I think led us now say, okay, we're going to need to pull in design earlier on this project. And it's going to need a lot more design resources because we're changing so much more. It's not just a simple add a toggle to the dashboard, add a guide kind of project. Wow. So like at Amazon, they care about building like audacious ideas. So they write the press release first. So everything is like optimized for a great press release. At Clerk, you care about a great developer experience. So you write the docs first and then you build for the docs. Yeah. Yes. As of two weeks ago, the emphasis is on the docs first. Uh, it used to be write the, write the SDK snippets first. Uh, huh. That was the, the main feature of the DX guide. And we're switching it to write the docs first. Wow. What's the, like, what's the role of product versus design? Like, mm. do you have like sort of X engineer product manager? Like this is so dev heavy. How do you hire like, and how do you balance like design versus product and how that all works? Who writes the docs? <laughs> this is very carefully. <laughs> uh, oh man. It's so hard. Um, it's it's a constant, uh, just constant learning battle. I think we've definitely found that our product people need a strong engineering background, um, and to a large extent, it's like not just a strong engineering background, but they they need to empathize with 
React and Next.js in this new wave of um, architectures that we're really playing into. I think we, for example, had to set the stage on this a little bit, like, you know, we started, it's my brother and I, we started in 2019 and we are like, why is auth so hard? And we should just like build Stripe for auth, right? Like, makes sense. That'll be easy. And we went and we did it and we basically rebuilt auth zero. And it was like this, <laughs> like, okay, it doesn't work. Why? Um, and then we had, like, went back to first principles, tried to figure out what's going on. And we ended up in this world of like, uh, basically emphasizing the Stripe checkout and the, the pre-built UIs more than uh, the, you know, RESTful APIs that to some extent, I think, made Stripe famous, right? Seven lines of code to uh, build a multi-billion dollar empire, whatever that, that headline is. Um, and, and so we, you know, zoomed out on the, on the, um, REST APIs and focused more on like, okay, well, how do we deliver just a UI? And, you know, for sign up, sign in, it feels like people are going to want that like in their app. They're not going to be comfortable with a redirect experience necessarily. And so we have to figure that out and that pushes into react and, um, and, and then we, you know, it, it started as a Ruby gem. And so then we became this like JavaScript heavy thing. And it was a lot of just talking to developers and like learning how that ecosystem works. Cause it is a little different. And I say that in response to this question, because, you know, to some extent it's like, it's not even just, we need engineers to do product. It's like, we need engineers who are empathetic to this new architecture to do product. Um, and you almost like can't hire like an X Stripe API designer to work on this. Cause it's like their model is last jet, right? Like, and it's um, obviously there's a lot of very talented people that, that, you know, learn and adapt and so on. Um, but it's, it's just surprising. To, it's been surprising to me that, so many people will come in and yeah, like just kind of want to revert in a sense um, instead of just like continuing to push forward and say, how do we do better for this particular audience? Um, the specifics of how it works right now, uh, we I don't have a product manager title in the company. And so it's all engineers. There is a, you know, there is a head of product, um, but even he's a lot of engineer. Um, but it's, it's kind of project by project. We uh, pick who's going to write the DX guide for this one. And they're they're They end up being like the de facto PM. Um, and it's, a hard job, right? Uh, and it's, I think a lot of people don't necessarily want to do that every project. And so there's a lot of cycling. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's another one of those, like, I'm almost uncomfortable giving an answer because it just, like, I don't feel like it's solved yet. Um, but, you know, we're doing, we're doing decent. <laughs> do you find that some engineers are better than others for whatever reason at writing docs and writing the DX guide? Is this like, you know, any engineer yeah. should do this or it's like, hey, there are engineers that think a specific way. They're a little bit more like empathetic towards the user or like we train our engineers to like how, yeah. I mean, yeah, d definitely. Um, you know, only some people will, will raise their hand to even like want to try that. Um, and you know, th then there's there's also the the pure like infra SRE types that you know they're they're keeping everything running and <laughs> they don't yeah they don't need to stay focused on this stuff um, yeah I, I think there's a there's almost a split of like art versus engineering that we're asking for here where the art is 
you know, write the docs, come up with the DX. And then the engineering is, is more of the implementation details after. Um, I'll say that's actually a big emphasis of the DX guide is you're not allowed to write implementation details in it. Uh, and, and so that's a whole nother step after, uh, where it, it's optional. Like if you want to do an RFC, you can do one and people will review your implementation details. Um, it's not mandatory, but like the DX guide is very specifically like, don't pull that stuff in because we just want to look at the DX. Uh, it has happened too, where people wrote down DX and then we learned we could, we couldn't find a way to do it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is, I think it's good. I like, I'd rather have that failure case than, than not explore, um, you know, what, what boundaries we can push on DX. Colin, when, when you think back to when you were like a jam sized company, so we're like in the 15 to 20, mm -hmm. um, I think we're 18 right now. Like, what was the makeup of the team? Do you remember? Like, how how many designers did you have? Like, was it all engineers? What was it like? It was it was definitely before the big design hiring we did, uh, and so we were still working with design contractors at that point. It was very very heavy engineering. I'm honestly struggling to think of someone that was not an engineer at that point in time. Um, yeah, like there, there were just very producty engineers there, but, but I think it was basically all engineers. What was it like? It was a endless scramble to get clerk to resonate. Right. I'd say we, we started growing in, um, 2023 really. And we started in 2019 and, uh, you know, we had customers like launched in 2021. We had customers out the gate. And, you know, what was nice about Clerk was we always felt like Clerk is better this week than the week before, right? Like it just always felt like the product is getting better and, you know, next week is going to be the week it, it tips up. Like we, we discovered something, it's going to go, it's going to go, it's going to go. Um, no one expected it to take four years or whatever it took. Um, but there was always like, there was never really, from my perspective, this like dread that we were on the wrong track. Um, there was certainly dread about runway and, and other things. Uh, but it always felt like, Hey, the product's getting better every week. And, you know, that time and that team it's just like incredible, right? Like, like the fact that we were able to collaborate so well while yeah, things just objectively were not flying. Right. Uh, and we weren't getting, you know, frustrated with each other and having tons of infighting and like, like it, it a business Sort of wasn't working, um, but we're all clinging to this, like, no, it feels like the product's resonating. And, and at that point in time, like all the engineers are the support people. And so we're all talking to the customers. We all see this happening and it, it feels good. But then there's also this doubt creeping in. I don't know. Um, you know, it, it's impossible to look back at that time and not be like just incredibly grateful that, that we were able to keep a team together and, and everyone worked with us through that, that journey of finding what's going to make it tip up yeah it's it's also hard to look back at it now because in some ways it was just so much easier back then uh right it was it, like we were doing one thing at a time for the most part and um yeah it's just a smaller group it's just easier to keep everyone on one track uh and so uh, yeah i don't know it's like slightly sentimental about it but um yeah it was it was it was a a hard and fun time it was the, the tldr and i'm curious to continue the story like when did things start to feel different who i the, everyone asked me this question like what happened in january 2023 that made it go and it it really doesn't 
like we don't know right like we figured out the react thing honestly before launch when we launched it was a, a simple react package and then we eventually did this fan out of there's a Next.js package and there's a remix package and so on uh, and we think that that helped we think that there was a just like a, a critical mass of feature parity um, against other tools that we were fighting. Um, you know, there was, there was ramping up the design that certainly helped. As I said that, I was like, oh, there was a designer on the team. It, it, there was a designer on the team at that point in time. Um, I just think of everyone as an engineer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think like, I would love if there was something we did in December, 2022, that I knew like that PR after that PR, everything started tipping up. It doesn't exist. Um, it, it was very much the accumulation of things. Something happened January, 2023, that like, we started to see that, you know, Paul Graham startup equals growth, 7% weekly growth rate. And then um you know theo the the youtuber did a video about it uh and we had a couple weeks of just like like 200 percent growth um and it, it was funny because in the first week we like we saw the growth and we were like where is this coming from and we couldn't find because it, it wasn't sponsored the first time you mentioned it, it wasn't sponsored um he had just found us and thought it was cool and we didn't have like good attribution. And so we're fighting and then and, like someone looks in plausible and is like, there's a lot coming from YouTube. And we had to go and like hunt down like what YouTube video mentioned us. And we figured out it was Theo. Um, and then we sponsored because like, you know, big audience. Um, but I, it, it definitely felt like just, I don't know, we got speed to value like we finally cracked the speed to value nut and people just started running with it. That's incredible. It reminds me, like, have you ever read Atomic Habits? I have not, no. The whole thesis of the book is like uh, improve 1% every day or whatever. And uh, it won't feel like much in the beginning, but at some point everything will have changed. So basically what you're saying is we tried to make our product better every week. And at some point we've reached this tipping point. We can't tell you what it is. There was no one PR. It was just the accumulation yeah. of all the efforts. That's very much what it felt like. We, no one at Clerk knows what it, what it was. And we, we've grown comfortable with that. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah. Okay. This has been, this has been a super inspiring. I'm walking away with like, um, write the docs first. Like if you want to prioritize a great developer experience, write the docs first. I think it's amazing. Um, I'm curious to wrap if Colin, you have any advice for us? So we're, we're 18 people. The product is two years old. Um, we're, we're we've got like this tiny go to market team. We're starting to hire more. We're going from contract designers to in-house. Like what, from your experience building clerk, any advice? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, like, I think the biggest thing for me is, is like, it's like, everything's harder than you expect. And, and so it just helps a lot to love the mission and like, love the users and love helping the users, right? Like, if, um, I, like I've had to push myself away from customer support conversations a little bit because while I'm good at the the initial response, I, it's hard to follow up just as my schedule's gotten a little crazier. Um, but like, man, do I just, I just want to do it, right? Like I want to jump in those threads and, and see them through to the end and then take that experience and cycle it back into the product. And I think it's just like, like, I don't know, it, like, I just enjoy it so much. Um, and I think in hiring people, we you know, try to make it clear that like, look, like auth is not 
inherently uh, right like we would all be doing ai right now if if we wanted to chase the shiny object um but there is a lot that we can help developers with and especially with this clerk framing instead of like an auth specific framing and and that vision i don't know honestly when i do interviews it's like i i i basically try to like scare people away right it's it's like i really want to make sure you know what you're signing up for and that you will love this um because if not it's it's just going to be bad for the culture it's not going to work out it's it, and and so, you know, in those final calls, I treat it as, as both. It's like a, a sell call, but also like, a, like yeah, like this, there's a, a certain way of doing things here. Um, and I think it's like, I don't know, like protect the culture. Uh, it's like love the customer and protect the culture. Is, right? Like my biggest fear for me as a founder is that like, when we hit the, you know, unicorn threshold and I want to quit. Uh, and I don't, I don't know why, but I look at a lot of startups that like reach that and you talk to the founders and they're just like exhausted and they want out and they, they find a way out, right? They exit. And, and it's like, at that point, it's a win for the investors. It's a win for the founders. Like you, you can empathize with it, but I just like, oh, I love, um, you know, uh, Stripe, HubSpot, like these places where the founders are on these 15, 20 year runs. Um, like that's what I want to do. And I, I want to build a culture where, you know, the team wants to do that too. Um, and it, it just takes a lot of deliberate thought and, and kind of keeping that alive. That's so inspiring. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's a hard one to 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 grok. It's it's my number one question for founders when I meet them. Um, like, if they're on a long run, like, how did you do it? Uh, and if they're not on a long run, like, is there anything you could have changed that you would have made it another ten years? Um, yeah. Colin, thank you so much. Of course. Yeah, no, this was a ton of fun. Um, kind of fun. Yeah. Oh, I, I love these things.